Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Okay, welcome back. We're at the end of week three. And what I'd like to do in this final lecture is to take the ballistic model that we've developed and compare it against an actual device, a couple of devices actually, to try to determine how close to the ballistic limit modern day transistors operate. It'll also give us an, an example of how you apply this theory to measure device characteristics. Okay. All right, just by way of quick review, we developed a theory for the ballistic MOSFET. We did it with Maxwell Boltzmann statistics because things were simple then. So we have simple expressions for the linear and for the saturated region currents. Uh, we have more complicated versions of the same IV characteristic that apply for Fermi Dirac statistics, and when we need to, we can evaluate those as well. So the question we're dealing with in lecture six of week three is how close to the ballistic limit do modern MOSFETs operate? So let's take some a recent MOSFET for which we have some data. This is a device that has uh, some key parameters are here. You know, the oxide is not quite as thin as it is in the transistors today. It has a polysilicon gate, has a drain voltage 1.2 volts. This particular device didn't intentionally use strain, so it hasn't got quite as high currents as you would see in the most recent devices. Uh, all the measurements were done at room temperature, and the particular device that we will look at had a physical channel length that was determined by a scanning electron microscope to be 60 nanometers long. So this is the device that we'll take a look at. Here are the measured IV characteristics. And I'll note that the on current is about 800 microamps per micrometer of width. Uh, as I said, if you use strained silicon, you'll tend to get higher on currents than this. And if you use slightly thinner uh, gate oxide insulators, you'll also get a little bit higher on currents. But, but this is a good on current for us. If we look at the slope under a highest VDS in the low VDS regime, that's the total resistance between the source and the drain, and that's the sum of a channel resistance and whatever series resistance is there. So we can just look at that slope and take one over the slope. Since we're taking voltage divided by current per micrometer, we express the resistance as 435 ohm micrometers. So if we have a one micrometer wide MOSFET, the resistance is 435. If we have a two micrometer thick MOSFET, the resistance is half of that. All right. Okay, if we look at the transfer characteristics under low and high VDS, you know, we could deduce, for example, a threshold voltage in the saturated regime, VTSAT. And in this particular device, it's about 0.42 volts. So that's a relatively high threshold voltage, and that's one of the reasons that the on current is a little bit lower than you'll see in the highest performance devices. But this would be a low leakage device, it would have low off current. So we can see that here. If we look at the transfer characteristics of this device on a log plot, low VD, high VD, we can look at the off current, and the off current is actually pretty low, five nanoamps per micrometer of width. The subthreshold swing, we just deduced that from the slope here, is 81 millivolts per decade, which is a good subthreshold swing. And there's no reason that the dibble and the subthreshold swing need to be the same numerical value, but they happen to be in this case. So the dibble is also a good value, less than, less than 100 millivolts per volt. So it's a well-behaved transistor. Now, when we're analyzing this device, we're going to have to be careful about series resistance. Remember, our theory is expressed in terms of the voltages that actually get into the heart of the device, but between the heart of the device and the contacts, there are these extra series resistances, and we have to account for that. Okay, so let's look at the on current first and see if we can deduce what the injection velocity is in this particular device. So the on current was 800 microamps per micrometer. Now, the series resistance for this device was independently measured. 
and it was measured at 220 ohm micrometers. So that is the fixed series resistance that's attached to the device, and we have to subtract that out or account for it. That means that if I'm looking at on-current conditions, I'm applying 1.2 volts to the gate terminal, and I have an on-current of 800 microamps per micrometer, but I have a voltage drop across the series resistance, which is half of this total here, 110 ohms. That means that the actual gate to source voltage between the intrinsic terminals is a little bit less than 1.2. It's 1.11. So I need to account for that. The measured gate inversion layer capacitance, or the measured gate capacitance under strong inversion conditions is 1.55 microfarads per centimeter squared. And now I can deduce the charge at the top of the barrier since I know the gate to source voltage on the internal terminals. We've estimated the threshold voltage and saturation. We've measured the gate capacitance. And I could take that value and I could divide it by Q, charge on an electron, to determine the number of electrons per square centimeter in the channel under these conditions. And it turns out to be 6.7 times 10 to the 12th per square centimeter. Okay, so that's the analysis. Now, we know that on current is related to average velocity at the top of the barrier. And we know that we have deduced the charge at the top of the barrier. So we can take this result, we can take the measured on current, and we can deduce the average velocity at the top of the barrier. And what we find is that it is 0.75 times 10 to the seventh centimeters per second. And now our question is, how close is this value to the ballistic limit? That's what we're trying to determine. Okay, so we go back to our calculation. The ballistic, the ballistic injection velocity is this unidirectional thermal velocity, 1.2 times 10 to the seventh centimeters per second, multiplied by a ratio of Fermi-Dirac integrals that increase that average velocity above threshold. Well, we know the inversion layer density. We've estimated that. So we can look here on this plot. Inversion layer density is 6.7 times 10 to the 12th. We would expect a ballistic injection velocity of 1.9 times 10 to the 7th centimeters per second. We know the actual velocity. So we could estimate the ballistic ratio the on currents are proportional to the velocities. So the ballistic ratio then, or the ratio of the measured on current to the ballistic on current is just the ratio of these two velocities. And what we find from that calculation is that this device delivers 40% of the ballistic on current. Okay, so that's relatively close. Close enough that we have to be aware of this ballistic limit and think about it. As I mentioned, this particular device was designed more for low leakage and not for maximum on current. So you'll find in transistors that are designed for maximum on current that this number is a little above 50%, even 60% or so. So we're within spitting distance of the ballistic limit. It's something that we need to be aware of and think about. Now, what about the linear regime? We could take a little closer look at that as well. So if I look at that linear regime, and I just take the slope of the current there, that's my total resistance between the drain and the source terminals. And that resistance was 435 ohm micrometers. Now that total resistance is the sum of the actual resistance of the channel plus the series resistance. And the series resistance was separately measured to be 220 ohm micrometers. So our channel resistance itself is 215 ohm micrometers. All right. Now, under these conditions, we're operating at lower currents, so the internal voltage is very close to the external voltage that was applied. Um, let's assume that the channel inversion charge is close to what it was before. Uh, Dibble was low, so we can account for that. And the result is that I could take these numbers, 
and I could do this calculation. I can deduce from the inversion layer density the location of the Fermi level. I know the inversion layer charge. I could deduce what the ballistic channel resistance would be. And what you'll find is that the ballistic channel resistance is roughly 60 ohm micrometers. Okay. So the measured, if I think in terms of conductance, take one over these, the measured channel conductance is less than a third, less than 0.3 of the ballistic channel conductance. Uh, okay. So what we've concluded here is that if I look at the ratio of the linear current to the ballistic linear current, that's about 0.3. If I look at the ratio of the high voltage on current to the ballistic on current, that's about 0.4. So one of the messages is, and this is a little bit surprising, is that transistors operate closer to the ballistic limit under high drain bias than they do under low drain bias. Now that's just the opposite of what you might have thought, because under high voltage carriers have a lot of energy and they can scatter more. So that's something that we're going to have to try to explain when we get to next week and discuss scattering in more detail. All right, now I want to turn to another comparison. This is an extremely thin SOI device fabricated at IBM. In this case, rather than doing the analysis from the measured data, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to do a fully quantum mechanical simulation of this structure in the ballistic limit using a simulation tool on a nanohub that treats the quantum transport of electrons under ballistic conditions self-consistently with the Poisson equation and we're going to compare that simulation to the measured result and see if we can determine how close to the ballistic limit we are. And here are the results. This is a 40 nanometer channel length, extremely thin SOI device. The red lines are the simulated results, including the measured series resistance for this device. The blue dots are the actual measured results. And what you'll see, it's a little bit hard to see in the linear regime because you have to separate out the contact or the series resistance. But the ratio of the linear current to the ballistic linear current is about 0.2 in this case. The ratio of the ballistic on current or the actual on current to the ballistic on current is about 0.6 in this case. That's a little bit higher performance device. So again, you'll see the basic message is that silicon MOSFETs deliver roughly one half of the ballistic limit on current. And it's interesting that that's been similar for about 15 years. You might ask, why is that? You know, if you do this kind of analysis, and you know, we did it many years ago on 250 nanometer channel length devices, you would find even at that time, the uh, devices were delivering about half of the ballistic on current. Now we're at 40 nanometer channel lengths and we're still at roughly half, just a little bit higher. You know, why is it, why is it stuck at about half or so? And a lot of that has to do with the need for well-tempered MOSFETs that are electrostatically well-designed. If I were to look at a device on this technology that had a 30 nanometer channel length, it would operate closer to the ballistic limit but it would have a subthreshold swing and a dibble and things that, that aren't, that make it uh, not as, uh, not as uh, well-tempered a MOSFET. So what happens in each technology generation is that you reduce the channel length, which would allow you to operate closer to the ballistic limit, but then you do things like thin the oxide, which introduces more surface roughness scattering, uh, raise the doping in the channel, which increases more scattering. The things you do to make the device electrostatically well controlled end up introducing more scattering, and at the end of the day when you're all done, you're back to about half of the ballistic limit. So that's been something that has been very tough to get around in silicon MOSFETs. It's just hard to get more than about 50 or 60 percent of the ballistic on current. The other very interesting thing from these analyses is you operate closer to the ballistic limit under high voltage than you do under low voltage. And that's something that, you know, at first glance doesn't appear to be right. It requires some explanation, and there's a very simple explanation that we'll discuss next week. Now, what about 3-5 transistors? You know, there are 3-5 transistors that are, operate in ways that are similar to MOSFETs, 
controlling potential energy barriers. What would happen in a 3.5 MOSFET? Well, let's compare by looking at silicon, where the mobilities tend to be roughly 250 centimeters squared per volt second. We know the effective mass. We can compute the unidirectional thermal velocity. We can deduce the, the uh, ballistic velocity. And we find that even at 40 nanometers, the ballistic mobility is significantly larger than the real mobility, which means that the device is not operating close to the ballistic limit, maybe in this quasi-ballistic limit. Now let's look at the same thing for an, an indium-rich in-gas uh, transistor called a hemp. Now this is a very different kind of device where the interfaces between these layers are grown with lattice-matched epitaxy and are atomically flat. We don't have the rough scattering that we do in a silicon dioxide, silicon interface. The mobilities can be very high on the order of 10,000 centimeters squared per volt second. Now you might think that, wow, I would get an enormous boost in current because the mobility is so much higher. Well, let's look at this. Uh, one of the reasons that the mobility is so high is that the effective mass is quite low. We can compute the unidirectional thermal velocity. It's almost double that of silicon. But we can also deduce the ballistic mobility. And when we deduce the ballistic mobility, we can see that it is considerably lower than the actual mobility. So for a 3.5 transistor like this, we would expect the ballistic mobility to be limiting the current, not the real mobility. And we would expect these devices to be operating very close to the ballistic limit. Okay, so silicon operates well below the ballistic limit, but our expectation is that 3.5 hemp's or high performance transistors should operate well above the ballistic limit. So here's, here's an example. These are some high-performance devices that were built in uh, Professor Jesus de Alamo's lab at MIT a few years ago. Uh, these are 40 nanometer channel lengths. Here you can see the indium gallium arsenide channel and the various wide band gap layers on top of it, a Schottky barrier gate. We won't go into the physics of this, but I'll just tell you at this time that it operates by manipulating potential energy barriers just the way that a MOSFET does. Now, here are measured and simulated results. So again, we did a numerical simulation of this device with a quantum model. That's not so important because there isn't a lot of quantum mechanical effects going on in the, this device. But it was a ballistic model also, and one that was done self-consistently with the Poisson equation. The red lines are the ballistic simulations. The blue dots are the measured results. The ballistic simulations include the measured series resistance of this device. And what you will notice is that this device is operating much closer to the ballistic limit. In fact, quite close, about 85% of the ballistic limit or so. So modern day high performance 3.5 transistors are indeed operating very close to the ballistic limit, just as you would expect. Okay, so we can wrap up. Uh, week three, and um, we'll wrap up this lecture in particular by reminding you of the key points that silicon MOSFETs operate at about half the ballistic limit, 3.5 MOSFETs operate close to the ballistic limit. Now if we want to understand these issues about you know, why are we below the ballistic limit, why are we half in one case and almost at the ballistic limit in the other case, why does there appear to be why do we operate closer to the ballistic limit under high voltage or under low, than under low voltage? In order to understand the answers to those questions, we need to understand scattering in more detail. So that's our focus in week four. We will look at scattering and transmission. We'll apply it to the MOSFET again, and then we'll be able to understand some of these questions. So thank you for sticking with me on week three, and I'll look forward to seeing you on week four.